has definitely been a good week. Our high schoolers returned from camp this week full of excitement, just like our junior hires did. And Addie still hasn't recovered from going to junior high camp, but our high schoolers are looking pretty good. We have a great uh, youth group tonight, so don't miss it. And make sure you bring people along with you. Uh, it's going to be really good. This morning, we are yet in 1 Corinthians. You know that it's our practice here to teach chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And many of you who have been following along know that we have been approaching 1 Corinthians 13 for a couple of weeks. It is uh, a monumental chapter. Uh, for those of you who know it, if, if you can't think of what 1 Corinthians 13 is off the top of your head, and maybe you're not real familiar with the Bible, you're going to recognize it just as soon as I start reading it. it is, uh, it's one of those things that everybody knows. And if you've ever been to Hobby Lobby, then you've seen it hanging on their walls there at Hobby Lobby. So let me read for you this morning 1 Corinthians 13. If you're using that Bible in the chair in front of you and you're looking for it, you'll find it on page 1152. I will read it for you. Actually, I'm going to start with just the end of chapter 12 and read it for you. And now, Paul says, I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily, easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man... I put the ways of childhood behind me. For you see, now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for speaking to us so clearly about this topic and yet it still overwhelms us. Would you be our speaker, our teacher today? Would you open our eyes and our ears? Would you send your Spirit to work in our hearts that we might have some understanding of what it is that you have communicated? We thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. These three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. On Wednesday, in our Bible study, we began this chapter. I honestly thought I was going to get all the way through it, but I didn't even make it halfway. We began working through this chapter, trying to, to put it into context. You know, it's in the middle of a letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. What was he talking to them about? What was he trying to communicate? Why did he include this right in the middle of a discussion on spiritual gifts? We, we worked on kind of breaking that down and understanding that sum. And discovered that it's big. But there's a lot to it. We've been kind of circling around this chapter for a few weeks now, getting closer and closer, and I've been working in my own mind, in my own heart, how am I going to present this to you? What am I going to tell you about this that might help you on your journey of faith? How am I going to explain what Paul wrote to you about this? I've looked at some of the, the great preachers that I follow from the past couple hundred years to see what they've done, and most of them have these lengthy sermon series on this one chapter. They'll zip right through 1 Corinthians, but really slow down here. How, how should I handle it? And it occurred to me that maybe what I should do is start at the end. 
and work backwards. Now, I, I really hope that you caught the Wednesday study. Whether you're here in person or caught it online, it'll help you understand a lot of what we're going to touch on today. But the Wednesday study, I start at the beginning. For Sunday morning, we're going to start at the end right here. Faith, hope, and love. These three remain. The greatest of them is love. And we're going to kind of try to take, I guess, a little bit of a scholastic view of it. We're going to kind of try to define these terms. What is Paul talking about? Faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. I mean, we know that he's been talking about a lot of other spiritual gifts. You know, prophecy and and speaking in tongues and all these things. And he's told us those are coming to an end. You guys, he told the Corinthians, are searching after these things. You're working hard to gain these things. But you need to understand they're only temporary. Those things are going away. The things you really need to be searching after, the great gifts of God, the things that really should define who you are, are these, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of them is love. But what in the world is he talking about? That term love means a lot of things. Reminded me of snow, actually, as I was thinking about it. You guys have heard, I'm sure, that in Inuit languages of Alaska, the native folks of Alaska, that there are 50 words for snow. Have you heard that? That is not true. I don't know how many words there are for snow. Probably more than 50, because there's more than 50 dialects of Inuit, and each dialect has a, a, a large number of words for snow. I can say none of them. I can pronounce not a single one, and I bet neither can you. But there are a few, and they describe different little attitudes of snow, different changes in snow. And that makes sense because it's very important to these folks what's going on with the snow. It's going to affect their daily life in a major way, whether it's a blizzard or just a light snow on the ground or just a dusting of snow that's following. And they need to be able to communicate that to one another. Makes sense, right? I know that we can understand it because rain is very important to us. Bob told me this morning in northwest Washington there's rain and there's August. Is what he told me. And I think that he's right. Do you know how many words we have for rain in the Pacific Northwest? This is just a small sampling. They don't have these words other places. I was talking to a man from Florida earlier today, and he, or earlier this week, and he was telling me that it was raining over in Oak Harbor. And I said, really, it's raining. What do you mean it's raining? And he said, well, it's raining. It's, it's raining hard. And it took me quite a while to figure out that what he was telling me was there was a massive storm shower, a deluge, a thunderstorm for about 15 minutes that completely saturated the ground and left standing water. All he could say is it's raining hard. I could think of multiple words to describe that because I grew up here in the Pacific Northwest and rain is important to me. I understand the differences. And any given day, I can tell you if it's just a light sprinkle, if it's just a mist, if it's a mist or a coastal mist or a wintry mist, I can tell you. But when it comes to love, you know I love my wife. We've been married 28 years. Love my wife. I thought I loved her when I married her. I, I'm sure I did, but it ain't, it ain't nothing like now. Love my wife. About 10 years ago, we bought a pickup truck. I drive it every day. You guys have seen it. The one new pickup truck. Fantastic. We've put 106,000 miles on that pickup truck in 10 years. I have driven it in all kinds of conditions. I've had it off-road getting firewood. We've hauled dirt with it. We've also gussied ourselves up in nice suits and dresses and gone out to nice dinner in it. I mean, it's fantastic. I hauled junior hires in it to camp and back just the other week. And in less than a week, I'm going to be loading it up to take my son to Nampa, Idaho for college. It is a, you know what? I love that truck. It was a great truck. I told you I'd, I'd haul junior hires to camp in it. On the way back from camp, Wendy called us and said, how are you guys doing? And I said, well, I need a shower and something to eat. Because at camp, those are two things you just don't get a whole lot of. And so we got back from camp and pulled up in the driveway in my wonderful truck and saw my wife that I love. And she says, come on in, take a shower. I'm making dinner. And she made Swedish meatballs and mashed potatoes. I love Swedish meatballs and mashed potatoes. But I don't love Swedish meatballs and mashed potatoes like I love my truck. But then I don't love my truck like I love my wife. We have one word. And it means so many things. It just doesn't make sense. We can have hundreds of words for rain, but one word for love. 
We talked on Wednesday night about how the classical Greek writers had three primary words that we translate love. The word storge, the word eros, and the word philio. Storge is affection. I have a great affection for this thing or a great affection for you. I have a great affection. Eros, of course, is a physical passionate love. We often translate that lust in our society, but initially... It was much more wholesome than that. It would talk about that sense of physical attraction between a husband and wife. Eros. And then, of course, filio, which is brotherly love. That's what we would all feel for one another in here. We watch out for each other. We care for each other. We put our arm around each other and help each other through life. And if somebody's down, we pick them up. Filio. Brotherly love. They had at least these three words for love. But when the New Testament was written... A whole new word was put into the classical Greek anthology. Now, it's not a word that people didn't know before in Greek. It's not like the New Testament writers invented it. It's a word that had been around, but that the classical Greek writers really didn't have any use for. They didn't have an application for it. They didn't have anywhere to plug it in until the New Testament writers wrote down the word agape. We let it roll off our tongue so easily. We're used to it. We name pizza places after agape. But this was earth-shattering, life-changing stuff when agape showed up. You see, the other kinds of Greek love are actually fairly self-focused, and they have to do with how I feel. I have affection, storge. I feel affection. I feel attraction. I have eros. I feel fond of you. You're my brother. I have phileo. You see? And these can change at any given moment. I might have eros now, but maybe I won't later. I might feel phileo for you now, but don't upset me. I might not later. But you see, agape is totally, completely different. First of all, it's not based on feelings. And it's not based on me. Agape is all about giving. The root of the word actually comes from the concept of sacrificial giving. Of just giving and giving and giving and giving with no expectation of return. Giving until I have nothing else to give and then continuing to give even when I have nothing. Pouring myself out until I am wasted and gone out of a sense that you are more important than me. That's agape. Like the definition that I have used, putting the needs and interests of someone else above your own, it's a poor representation, but it gives you a flavor of what this is talking about. Like I say, that the, the classical Greek authors writing in the times of Hellenism and in the times of the Roman Empire and this kind of stuff, they didn't know what to do with this word, agape. They had no use for it. They had no value for it. When did they ever see this in their society? When did they see this in their culture? And then Jesus came and all of a sudden they said, aha, that's it. That's where agape goes. Paul says to the Corinthian church, you've been pursuing a lot of things. You've been pursuing a lot of things. You've been pursuing speaking in tongues. You've been pursuing wild prophecies. Knock that off, he says. And instead, pursue faith. We can define faith. That's pretty easy. We will in a minute. Hope. We can figure that out pretty easily. And agape. And by the way, Paul says, of the three, the most important is this agape. Faith. What is faith? There are some great definitions of faith in the Bible. Probably our favorite is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen, for by this our ancestors were approved. Faith is this God said it, I believe it, we're done. Faith is God has given me His Word. And I believe it. Now, I don't understand it all. It doesn't all make sense to me. There's some of it I just can't put together, but I believe it. Faith is, God said He created the world in six days, and then He took a day off. And so I say, okay, God created the world in six days and took a day off. I don't know how that worked. I wasn't there. I'm getting older, but I'm not that much older. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. But I believe it because He said it. Now, 
as science has grown and evolved, it's, 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 it's beginning to look more and more like science is going to point to that exact thing and say, well, that's the only way it could have happened. But that's not changing, adding to, or subtracting from what I believe. I believe it because God said that's what happened. He said that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and rose up out of the grave three days later. I believe it. I absolutely, completely, totally, 100% believe that. Now, I have spent a lot of time studying the evidences of that, and I've got a good pile of them I can give to you if you want, but when it comes down to it, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. But I know it happened. I have that faith. There's a little bit more to faith. Wendy talked about it last week. James chapter 4 tells us that faith, without taking some form of action, is useless. Faith that does nothing is useless. I have used this analogy before and I really like it. If you came up to me after church today and you said, hey, I'm thinking about going skydiving. I was invited to go skydiving with some friends. I'm thinking about doing it. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun. What do you think? Is it safe? Should I do it? I'll tell you, yeah, do it. Do it. Oh, it's completely safe. Listen, they're going to strap you to another person who knows what they're doing. They're going to pull the rip. You'll be fine. They even have a backup parachute. I've talked to people who've done this. They think it's the greatest thing ever. They say that everybody should do it. If you ever talk to a paratrooper from the army, they'll tell you it's the biggest rush you can ever have. Go. If you've been invited, go skydiving. And then they're going to say, great, you want to come with me? And I'll say no. I believe it's fantastic. I believe it's great. I believe it's the biggest rush. I believe it's perfectly safe. But I'm not going to do it. I guess I really don't have faith, you see. Faith is more than just this cognitive, I believe this thing. Faith is actually stepping out and living my life based on what I believe. Let me give you a great story to illustrate this. It's out of John chapter 4. Fantastic story. Jesus is in Cana of Galilee in this story. You remember Cana? That's where he turned water into wine at a wedding. He is at Cana. Cana, by the way, is 16 and a half miles from Capernaum. It's really important to think about when you think about this story. Capernaum was the regional capital where all of the royal officials resided. Capernaum. Cana was just a little backwood village. If a royal official wanted to travel from Capernaum to Cana, I don't know why they would, but if they did, they would ride on horseback. Horses will trot 10 to 12 miles an hour. That is pertinent to the story. Jesus is in Cana, and at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, he gets approached by a royal official who has traveled that morning from Capernaum. He got up in the morning, he saddled his horse. I doubt that it was quite like this picture, but it's kind of a cute Sunday school picture. He got up in the morning, he put a saddle on his horse, he grabbed a couple of of, uh, servants, and he headed off to Capernaum. And he got to Capernaum by lunchtime. That tells me he couldn't have left home much later than maybe 10 o'clock. I mean, a couple hours travel is more than enough. He gets there to Cana for one reason and one reason only. Because he has heard that Jesus is there. And this royal official has a son at home who is sick and nearing death. This man has heard that Jesus can heal the sick and raise the dead. Jesus at this point was not some big public figure like he would be. It's just that this official in Capernaum has heard that Jesus has the power to heal people. And he's got a boy who needs healed. And so he goes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, will you come heal my son? He is sick. He is nearing death. Jesus says to the people gathered around, you people have no faith. Unless you physically see it happen, you won't believe. That's not faith. Unless you see me do it, you won't believe. The official said, Jesus, I don't don't know about that. I don't know about any of that stuff. All I know is if you don't heal my boy, he's not going to live. Jesus says, aha, that's faith. You believe so much that I can heal the boy that you left Capernaum mid-morning, got on your horse, rode straight through to Cana, this little backwood village, just so that you could see me because you know without a doubt that if I come and touch your boy, he'll live. I'll do you one better than that, Jesus said. Just because of the faith you have, I want you to know right now, he said, Mr. Royal Official, your boy is just fine right now. He is healed right now. He's fine. 
Thank you, said the royal official. Thank you for healing my son. Now, it is one o'clock in the afternoon. It will take you less than two hours to get home to check on your boy. What do you do? You leave. Thank you, Jesus. It's been nice. Capernaum's kind of a dive. I'm, or pardon me, Cana's kind of a dive. I'm going back home to check on my boy. But not this guy. He stayed. Oh, my boy's fine? Cool. Don't have to worry about that anymore. <sighs> Got some business in the area. Need to collect some taxes up here. I need to go talk to a couple of people. If my boy's fine, I'm not worried about it. I'm just going to do what I need to do. It is the next day before the man gets home. He spent the night out there. Would you have done that? I'd have gone home to check on my boy. But you see, this man had faith. He had real, solid faith. Jesus said, boy's healed, boy's healed, whatever. He had not seen it with his eyes. He did not call them on his cell phone. How's he doing? He just knew that since Jesus said it, it was done. So he wasn't in any rush. Here's the thing with faith. Faith has an expiration date. Faith eventually is satisfied. The following day, when the man got home, he went to his house, he opened the door, he said, how's my boy doing? They said, he's great. He's doing absolutely fantastic. He's up playing video games right now. And the man said, oh wow, I knew he would be fine, but I'm curious, at what moment was he better? And the people of the house said, you know, it's the weirdest thing, right about one o'clock, all of a sudden fever was gone, he just sat up, he was feeling great, he just got up and started doing stuff. And the man said, I knew it! No more faith. He saw with his eyes now that the thing that Jesus said was done, the faith has been met, it has been satisfied, it has been completed. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. Now he sees. Faith is met. Faith has an expiration date. How do you develop faith? Faith is, I've heard so many times and told you as well, faith is like a muscle. You develop faith as you use faith. God leads you in a particular way. You go that particular way. Things worked out. Oh, that was good. I think I'll do that again. You do it again. Oh, I'm getting stronger. The more He leads you in a particular way or whatever, the more you go that way, the more you step out on faith, the more you give to faith promise, the more you know you can give to faith promise. Those kinds of things. Faith is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. The less you use it, the more it atrophies. That's why Jesus says, faith, hope, and love, those are the greatest, but love is greater than faith. Faith is is vital. It's vital to your existence as a Christian. You can't trust God without it, but, but you need to understand, one day it will have an expiration date, and also it's something that you can build up on your own. I, I guess a way to look at that is to say that faith is kind of rearward looking. I did receive this message from God in the Bible. And now I believe it. And I'm going forward, you see, based on what He has given me. I do believe that He can, the official would say, heal my son. So I'm going to step out and do something about that now. That is something behind me. It's solid. It's like the Old Testament concept of the Ebenezer. He's gotten me this far. I know I can go farther. And the farther I go, the stronger I get. Until finally, the faith is met and it's concluded and it has expired. That's faith. Hope is different. We have talked quite a bit about hope. I want to I give you my own kind of definition of hope, and it is the confident expectation of good things that are coming. Now, we've talked about the fact that hope is not wistful thinking. We've talked about this before. I've got a good analogy for you. I mentioned my wife and I have been married for 28 years. I remember when we were dating at 16, 17, 18 years old, one of our favorite songs was by the Beach Boys. And it was that song that says, wouldn't it be nice if we were older? Do you remember that? Then we wouldn't have to wait so long. You guys know this song? All about this teenage couple that's dating and how they wish they were old enough to get married because if they were just old enough to get married, well, then everything would be wonderful. They would live in a big house in the kind of world where they belong. And they would wake up together and the sun would be shining and oh, it would just be wonderful. That is wistful thinking. That is not hope. 
Hope began for us one summer in 1990, or one, I don't remember the day, in 1993, we went to Seaside, Oregon, and I got down on my knees on the beach and gave her a ring. And we set a date, July 30th, 1994, and that's when hope began, you see. Because now we have a confident expectation of something that's coming. It's no longer just a wistful, oh, I wish it would work out. Now it's, this is going to happen. This good thing that we are longing for is going to happen. I know it's going to happen. I can point to the fact that it's going to happen. It is a confident expectation. Nothing will stop it. This will happen. You understand? Hope is a confident expectation of the good things that are coming. Now, it's built on faith. Jesus has said One day, I will draw you with Me. You'll see Me face to face. One day, you'll see the great cloud of witnesses of those who've gone on before cheering you on. One day, that will happen. We believe that. That's the faith that starts it. But we're focused on that hope. And see, the thing is, that hope is then what gets us through life based on that faith. We can endure a lot of things because we know what's coming. Listen, that year that we were engaged, there were a lot of things to endure. There were tuxes to try on and cake to sample and stuff that I just didn't even care about. But I could do it. I could endure it. I could handle it because of the good thing that was coming. This is what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians where he says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Can I get a witness? Our inner self is being renewed day by day. Everything around us is going away. It's falling apart. But inside we're being renewed and made stronger because you see this light and momentary affliction. He's talking about the troubles in this life. This light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. The expectations that we have not met yet, that we know are coming. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That is hope. Here's the thing with hope. Hope, too, has an expiration date. Wendy and I were engaged. The expiration date was July 30th, 1994. Our hope expired that day. It was met. It was done. There is no more hope for this event because the event has happened. We have received the good thing, you see. Hope has an expiration date. I hope to stand face to face with Christ one day. That's going to happen, and I'm excited about it. And when that happens, that hope will be concluded. It is getting me through this life based on the faith that He has told me, but one day it will be, it will be concluded. And hope, like faith, is something that I do. It's something that I work on. I step out in hope. I focus on that hope. Yes, I understand that's hope that He's given me. That's faith that He's given me. But I employ it, you see. I stay focused on it or choose not to stay focused on it and struggle through life. But if I stay focused on it, you see, the more I stay focused on it, the more focused on it I become. This is how people in China endure this great persecution of the church. They're so focused on the good things that God is giving them day by day by day. And the more of them they receive, the further they focus out until they are totally focused on eternity. And they can bear the light and momentary affliction, you see. Let me give you a, let me give you a story, an example, a really good example of how hope does not work. The story comes from Mark chapter 4. It's one of my very favorites in the Bible. I believe that young John Mark was there when Jesus got on the boat and said, let's go to the other side. You see, Jesus had gotten up early that morning and spent some time in prayer with the Father and gotten His instructions. And His instructions were, you're going to preach and heal in this area for a while, and then when that's over, you're going to get in a boat and you're going to go over to the region of the Gedardines where there is a man who is possessed by a legion of demons, and you're going to cast out that legion of demons, and then that man is going to go to the Decapolis, the ten cities, and he's going to tell them all about you. And Jesus said, okay, I'll do that. So he got up in the morning and he preached and he taught and he healed. And then as evening came, he got into a boat with his disciples and he said, okay, let's go to the other side. Now understand that at that moment, he had given them something to hope in. I'm not talking wistful thinking. Well, I hope we make it to the other side. 
He has given them something to count on. A confident expectation. The master is in the boat and said we're going to their side. By the way, this is the same guy who said let there be light and there was light. Alright? I think if he says we can make it to their side, we're going to make it. They, they had at that moment the opportunity to have a confident expectation that they would land on the other shore. Because Jesus said it, and since He said it, they have faith, they have forward-looking hope, you see. To begin with, they were fine with that until a storm came up. Now, you know this story. There are many thinkers down through the centuries who believe that this storm was not a natural storm. It wasn't just wind. But that, you see, Satan too knew that Jesus was going to the other shore to deal with this demon-possessed guy and was trying to find a way to stop this from happening. And so kicked up this big storm under the allowance of the Father, kicked up this big storm, and it nearly worked. The disciples who had been told by Jesus that were going to the other side and could have been focused on that instead got so distracted by the storm around them that they knew they were going to die. They were just convinced they were going down. The water is swamping the boat. It looked worse than this picture, I'm sure. But where's Jesus? Mark tells us. He's sleeping on a cushion. He was tired. He found a comfortable place to lie down. Got nice and comfy, curled up, covered up in blankies. Said, wake me when we get there. Jesus was not at all concerned about the storm. Matter of fact, the rocking of the boat probably helped lull him to sleep. Because he had this hope that they're going to get to their side. Confident expectation. They're going to get there. He's got work to do. They're going to get there. There is no devil that can stop him. This is the hope. There, there's, there's nothing that can stop him from getting to the other side. He's going to get there. So, he may as well just take a nap. He'll wake up on the other shore. You know the story. The disciples came and woke him up and said, Jesus, don't you even care that we die? You know, he doesn't even respond to them. (laughs) Come on, they're not going to die. They're with the Master and the Master's going to the other shore. I mean, listen, yeah, it's going to be a struggle. Sure, light and momentary affliction. It might be a pain in the rear, but we're going to get there. Imagine if they had just been focused on that. The wind and the waves kick up and it's this massive storm. They would have been able to laugh at the storm and say, give it a good shot, but the Master said we're going to the other side, so I am not worried. No, it's not comfortable, and I'm getting soaked in seawater and blown around, but I know we're going to make it to the other shore because Jesus has an appointment there. That's hope. If faith is rearward looking, hope is forward looking. Forward looking to its expiration date. To the point when we make that other shore. When our hopes are concluded. When we have met that thing. If faith is a muscle we must exercise to develop, hope is a walkway that we must step on to develop. We keep heading toward the hope. It's not like love. You see... Faith, hope, and love are kind of like a truss bridge. You know a truss bridge. There's two anchors, one on either side. In this case, in this picture, the anchors are these mighty pillars. My favorite truss bridges are the ones where they're anchored into rock. The anchors on either side are faith and hope. On one side there is faith, solidly built, that we can trust in completely. The Word of God, we have no doubts. This is where we start. On the other side, the anchor we're heading toward, that's our hope, our confident expectation of where we're going. It is unshakable. It is solid. It's not going anywhere. We can count on it. We are going to arrive there, you see. We step off from faith and we start heading toward hope. What's in the middle? John Corson says, many of today's Christians are like a a saggy mattress. They got... A lot of faith on one side and a lot of hope on the other and absolutely nothing in between. I think maybe he's right. We want to be known today as Christians for our faith. 
We want to be known for the things we believe in. Matter of fact, if you click the first homepage of just about any solid Bible-believing Christian church, one of the very first things right there is what we believe. We want to be known for what we believe in. We want to be known for our faith. And Christians today are very focused on eternal hope. It doesn't really matter what I do in this life because I know that I'm going to be with Jesus, you see. And many of the Christians you talk to, they don't know much about the Bible. They're not really strong in their faith. They don't really know that much. But they do know that Jesus has saved them and that they're going to wake up in heaven one day. And there's just... That's just it. That's just it. These things that I believe in, these things that I've staked my identity on are things with an expiration date. Paul says no. The greatest of these is agape love. Rather than just try to define what agape love is, like I did with faith and hope, I want to, I want to tell you a couple of things that Jesus said about it. First of all, He said that it's new. This is a new thing. I love the fact that this phrase, agape, first shows up in the New Testament because Jesus first shows up in the New Testament and He brings it. It's a new thing. We've never had anybody to apply it to before. We're going to apply it to Jesus. Jesus says, listen, now I want it applied to you. You, He says, the followers of Christ are now the carriers of agape. You have heard before to phileo one another, and that's good. Brotherly love is nice. That's great. I am giving you a new command, and the new command is a sense of deep sacrificial giving to one another at all times. And, he said, this is the thing that you're to be known for. The Corinthian church wanted to be known for their incredible displays of spiritualism, you see. They wanted to be known for their ability to speak in tongues and roll in the aisles. And there are still churches like that today. Most American churches want to be known for their faith and their hope. They want to be known for their incredible ability to believe these things. And they want to be known for their incredible ability to be focused on these things. He says, no, the thing I want you known for is your agape your continual sacrificial giving because you see, nobody else has that. That doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. I have met some wonderful Hindu people. It doesn't exist with them. I have known some pretty nice Muslim people. It doesn't exist with them. He says that, honestly, I've known a lot of Christian people. It doesn't exist with too, quite frankly. He says the, the, the group that is to be known for this are those who are following after me. Well, then, then what does it look like? How do we know if we're doing it? Well, Jesus gave them an example right before this. They all met together for one last dinner. They show up at the house for dinner and there are some protocols, some traditions of how things go. There are traditions about where people sit. Who sits at what we would now call the head of the table and who sits on his right and who sits on his left. And those sorts of things. There's a ranking between the seated order and how you sit. One of the great traditions of a formal dinner in those days was the washing of the feet. As the people came into the room, the most important first and so on in rank, as they came into the room, they would be met by the lowest ranking person in that household. Generally the lowest ranking slave, often a young girl that they would be met by as they came in, and she would wash their feet. And the reason she washed their feet is because they stunk. Because they had like sandals on at best. Most of them would have been barefoot. They're walking in some very dusty roads. If they're not dusty, they're muddy. Their primary uh, vehicle in those days, besides their own feet, was animals who tend to leave things in the road that get on people's feet. Their feet were caked with dirt and dust and yuck. And they're about to go sit in dinner where their feet are exposed and they're sitting right next to the feet of the person in front of them. we got to get that cleaned off. Also, imagine after walking all day how refreshing it would be to have that 
gunk washed off. You know, we've, I've seen foot washings and things at church and you take off your shoes and your socks and it's a nice clean bowl and you pour a little water on it. No, 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 no. We've got to scrub that crud off, you see. This is not an easy, quick, ceremonial thing. They come in for dinner. Jesus first, He is the head. Everybody in rank behind Him. Lining up, finding their spot at the table. They all sit down at their table. And one tradition is missing, and that is there has been no one there to wash the feet. It seems that the person who owned this home at the time is just gone and took his household with him. Tradition dictates that the lowest ranking member among them must become the servant and wash the feet. Nobody does it. So, you know the story. Jesus stands up, and the first thing He does is takes off His outer garment. This was an act of incredible humiliation to publicly take off your clothes. But a servant operated in little more than a loincloth. He became a servant, like it says in Philippians chapter 2. He poured Himself out. He gave up the most important position at the dinner to take on the least important position at the dinner. Why? Because people need their feet washed. Because there is crud and yuck stuck to their feet. Some people say that in order to love like a Christian, we must become, for lack of a better term, a doormat. Anybody can use us for whatever we want and we just keep giving. Some people say that in order to love like a Christian, we must accept everybody, and we do, but not just accept the person, but accept everything about the person. They want to bring their known sin into our midst. We must just accept them. They want to behave in a way that's unbiblical and stinks. We must just accept them. Pastor Rudy was telling me uh, just yesterday about a couple that's been coming to his church. A man and a woman. They met at the church. They are now living together. They want to be baptized. He said, what should I do? Well, there are some who would say we would just cheer them on. Jesus did not do that. He didn't say, listen, I see all of you have stinky feet, but I accept you. He said, I love you, and I'm going to die for you, and I'm also going to scrub the crud off your feet, you see, so that you don't have to go through life carrying the stinky. He humbled himself becoming the lowest form of a servant, humiliating Himself. He who was the head, He gave all of that away, not for some ceremonial thing, but because they had stinky feet. And He could do something about that. And so He gave away everything He had and everything He was in that moment to help them get right. That's, that's real Agape love. Giving and giving and giving and giving sacrificially for one purpose, that we might be clean before the Father. That's agape love. Can you imagine if, if we lived that way? Giving and giving and giving. Everything we are, everything that, all of the honor that we have, all of the position that we have? Oh, not just because somebody's hungry. Oh, that's great. Give to somebody's hungry. Not just because someone is in need of clothing or school supplies. That's great. Give clothing and school supplies. It's wonderful. But no, no, no. See, we're giving and giving and giving so that people can be right with the Father. That's agape love. And that's what Christ came and did when He died on the cross for us. He gave up His very life so that we could be right with the Father. Agape love. Love that is patient and kind. Love that doesn't envy and isn't boastful and isn't arrogant and isn't rude. Hey, you got stinky feet. Love that's not self-seeking. Somebody wash my feet. Love that's not irritable, irritable and does not keep a record of wrongs. I know what you did and I'm remembering that. I'm counting that against you. You stepped in it and I had to wash it and now you stepped in it again. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
What are all of those things? Those are all of those things that we hope for. The final consummation of all that God wants to do in our lives. I believe that you can receive from Him all that He wants to do in your life. Here's the big thing. Faith we gain as we use. God said it. I believe it. I will step out in it. I will get stronger. Hope we gain as we focus. I know that there is a future for me. God has made me a promise. I'm going to stay focused on that promise. The more that I stay focused on that promise, the more focused I become on that promise. Love is not something I do. This is not something I can develop. I don't have this. Just like the Greek writers not having use for it, not having application for it, I don't have it. It doesn't exist within me. I am a naturally selfish person, and so are all of you. And that is absolutely the antecedent of agape. Agape comes as I stay connected to Christ. Jesus has said, remain in me as I remain in you, and you will bear much fruit. What is that fruit? Galatians 5. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love. Agape, defined as joy, peace, patience, thankfulness, grief. I don't remember them all. Thank you, yes. I have to do the little song and I wasn't going to do the little song. That is the fruit that we grow as we stay connected to Christ. That's, that's where it comes from. That's where agape comes from. It's only from Him. He is the supplier of this thing. And you know, it doesn't have an expiration date. It is never done. Hebrews tells us that the work of Christ is done, the work on the cross. What's He doing now? He's still interceding for us. He is still pouring Himself out. It's never done. It's never done. It's the center span. Yes, my life is built on faith. I can step forward. I am focused on hope. I know where I'm going. How am I going to get there? Agape. Our church is built on the foundation of the Word of God. We believe these things unshakable. We have a hope for our church. We have a hope for our community. We have a hope for one another. We have a hope for the future. That's where we're heading. How are we going to get there? Sacrificial pouring out. Complete giving. Agape love. That's why faith, hope, and love remain. Because all the other stuff, all the other stuff we do... That building that we built down in Guatemala a couple of years ago, yeah, one day it's going to crumble to the ground. The nice paint we put on the church building, it's going to shrivel off. The weeds that we pulled across the street for the older folks that couldn't do it themselves are going to grow back. Sorry, it's just the truth. But faith, hope, love, no, 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 you're not going to take those away. But the greatest of them is love because love is the way that we're known. Love is the thing that doesn't have an expiration date. Love is the thing that we can't do for ourselves that we receive just from Christ. Now, what do I want you to do with this information? I want you to stay connected to Christ. That's what I want you to do with it. I want you to get up every morning. I learned this week that the first half hour of the day after you first wake up, I don't know how you define wake up, your cerebral cortex is at its uh, strongest to absorb, to like hear new information and these kinds of things. Yeah, so get up in the morning and absorb the Word of God. How about that? Spend time with Him. Focus on Him. Get to know Him. And as you get to know Him, say, you know, I believe these things and I'm going to step out on these things and I know what's coming and I'm focused on what's coming and the way I'm going to get there is just to rest in you and let you grow in me that agape love. It is common with that chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, to try to put your own name in. So instead of love is patient, love is kind, I would say Troy is patient, Troy is kind. And see if you actually are. And I can tell you, I am not. But I'm a lot more than I used to be. A lot more than I used to be. And that's what we need to do. And that's how we grow together, and that's how we're known, and that's how the community is transformed. Let's stop and pray. Lord, I thank you for leading us into this most difficult thing. The surrender of ourselves to you. 
I thank you for giving us such great hope. I thank you for giving us such great truth to build our our lives on in faith. I pray that you would make us a church of agape. We don't even know what that would look like. I pray that you would cause us to be so connected to you. And Lord, if there is one here that has heard these stories again and again, and who has just never surrendered themselves to you, They've heard about your love on the cross and how you sacrificed yourself for us. And they've heard about how you rose again. And and they believe these things, but they've they've never said, Lord, I want to be one of your followers, a person growing in love. And I pray today they would just call on you, just tell you that. Just tell you that truth from their heart. And that you would touch them and draw them and that they would have a sense to know that they have done some business with you today. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.